All right, hello everyone. Welcome to our afternoon session. We're here for small scale grain and dry bean production with our speaker, Nazirak Amen. Uh, my name is Max Farrar. I'm a small veggie grower from Warren County outside of Bowling Green. I'm here to assist today. Um, if you do not have a yellow feedback card, please make sure you raise your hand and I'll come get one to you. Um, please leave these in a neat pile at the end of your table, at the end of the session. This helps Oak get good feedback. Um, we're also going to hopefully have some time for Q&A. If you have any questions, please hold them till the end. Um, and please wait for a mic to come to you so that we can get that on the recording. Um, all the things you see in the presentation are going to be uh, on the conference website after the conference. So any resources that are uh, presented will be able to access later. Um, thank you all for your time and thank you for coming out. Um, if you have any questions about um, continuing education credits, please see the folks at the Oak table before you leave. Um, they've got all that for you there. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Nazirak to give his presentation. Good afternoon. Peace, everyone. Uh, so we're here to talk about small-scale grain production, processing, and equipment. Um, so we live in the Mid-Atlantic. I, I live in the D.C. Beltway, and we do all of our grain production um, uh, around the city. We have about, well, it's, it's um, about 20 acres of growing on three different plots that we work. Um, you know, people ask if we ever get tired of moving around and hauling around equipment. The answer is yes. We would love to have a farm um, that we lived on. I work my medical practice kind of in the city, and so it's easier for us to live in the city and commute out to the country than it is to be in the country and commute into the city. Um, and so. <clears throat> So how we got into this, we do, um, so I, I mean, Purple Mountain Grown uh, is sort of an offshoot of Purple Mountain Organics, um, which was a business that we started more from, uh, how can I say this, from uh, a sustenance operation that we were doing and along with in my medical practice part of what we do with with all of the patients that come in we put them on a detox diet um, which usually includes a shift in their diet and um, and so in that respect uh, we started doing cooking classes and from those cooking classes um, and the cooking classes were small scale cooking classes where people would come in and we'd take about 10 people in. And the idea was that each person would have something to do with uh, whatever we were preparing so that the patients could go back home individually and be able to prepare a few meals on their own um, and have the understanding to do it and not watch somebody else do a cooking class. So the people started asking us to help them grow food and so we ended up um, doing more of a, a, a farming operation that expanded into some work, some contract farm work. And then I think about 2014, what year? 2012, um, we wrote a grant which was um, dryland rice production um, in the Mid Atlantic. Um, which was basically, uh, we'll talk about it more, but from there, from the rice production, once you start growing grains, that opens the door, any grain, it opens the door to more grains. Um, so we've expanded from rice into a, quite a few different grains. Um, we are in a few of the local farmers markets and you can see we have a pretty extensive lineup of products that we bring to market um, in terms of dry beans and uh, some of the products that we have. So we do 
usually one or two different varieties of hard wheat, a um, couple different varieties of soft wheat. We do corn. We'll talk about all the different things that we do in the presentation, but this all started with uh, the rice production. And really, the rice production started because we eat rice, <laughs> and <laughs> we love rice. I grew up in Louisiana. Um, rice, when I grew up, was part of every meal. I think rice has become a lot more toxic uh, with the arsenic and the cadmium now. Um, so people do eat less rice, but we love rice. And the other, um, well, we'll get to the rice production. So why grow grains? Uh, right now, you know, the commodity crop system is based on grain production, but not much of it goes back into the local system. I mean, now we have sort of an artisanal, like, brewery type thing, but not much of it goes back into uh, the food system. So processed and modified grains are at the core of a lot of the unhealthy food system. So I see a lot of patients and I see people who complain of gluten intolerance and, you know, the new thing is uh, SIBO and CFO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, fungal overgrowth. Um, leaky gut syndrome, there's a lot of stuff that people blame on grains that human beings as a species have eaten for thousands of years, and I'm trying to figure out why we can't eat them now when we've been able to eat them for ages. And so I don't think that all of a sudden grains became bad for us. I think it's a, it's a combination of how grains are grown and also how uh, we process the grains. So, um, so the grains also help to sort of diversify the farm. If you're doing vegetable productions or if you're doing animals, grains add a carbon component um, that you're basically taking back in the land in some way. Um, and so, you're increasing your soil health by increasing more carbon into the soil. And for us, it's created sort of a niche market um, in that we, um, we specialize in grains and dry beans at the market. And, you know, we can be there with other vendors, with other vegetable producers. And even though we grow um, some vegetables in the summertime, um, at the market, at the local market that we in, we're in, um, we mostly bring stuff that other farmers don't like to bring. Like we bring melons, we bring, uh, what else do we bring to the market that other, we grow a lot of okra, I love okra, farmers don't like okra because it's itchy. Um, so we grow stuff that other farmers don't like to grow and we have the grains. And so we've been able to be pretty successful at the market. Um, a lot of our market, we actually, our best markets are winter markets. Um, right now we're in a market, uh, DuPont Circle, which is a market in downtown DC. It's one of the, I guess, the most lucrative markets in the area. So um, in the winter time, we kind of switch between that market and our local uh, market that's a couple blocks away from my house. Um, but these markets make it really um, um, a good, we found a good niche with the grains. Um, one thing about the grains and the markets, um, our buddy uh, Heinz, who, who we work with, he was in DuPont Circle and he would bring a huge um, produce setup and he had grains on like one table in the corner. And so, you know, he was like, oh, you're going to bring grains to the market. People don't buy a lot of grains. Like, you know, I got them over there. And so, but when we showed up at the market with our grains and we had grains at the center of the table, it was a completely different outcome than what he did when he went there and the grains were kind of on the side. <laughs> um, so, um... So the biggest obstacles to small-scale grain production is lack of infrastructure, meaning, you know, basically what's happened with grain production in the U.S. follows the story of a lot of the farms since World War II. 
Um, America kind of upscaled, and small farmers have been sort of eased out of the system. You know, most of the grain production equipment, you know, are these sort of old combines that you can find that probably haven't been, been in use since the 50s or 60s. Um, the, you know, the, a lot of the old sea clean equipment um, haven't been in use for years. Um, I think some of the Amish and Mennonite folk still have some grain production uh, systems in, in some of the, the newer things that have come out have come through them, but that's still hard to get. Um, a lot of the equipment that we were able to find in the beginning really came from uh, research equipment uh, from universities. Um, and there's issues with some of that because, you know, it's for research. Research plots are like 15 feet long and, you know, three foot wide strip, and that's what they're harvesting, and they're putting it in a little bag, and, you know, that's kind of what a research combine is made to do. So if you run a research combine on an acre plot, it might take you 10 hours to harvest. Uh, so these are things that you want to consider when you're looking at um, some of the, the, uh, the old equipment that's out there. But we did find a lot of equipment through um, like seedequipment.com. There's old uh, seed research companies that have machines from uh, mostly like division, uh, research divisions of seed companies that have a lot of grain cleaning equipment still around at an affordable price. Um, So, hold on, here we go. All right. So getting started, start small. The easiest grain to grow is really corn and some beans, um, which are also used as specialty crops. So a lot of produce farmers are familiar with sweet corn and fresh beans. Um, and you want to grow the amount, the capacity that you have, an area that you can actually process. Um, you want to convert. You can convert, like, um, we started, in the beginning I had a combine and I didn't have many grain fields. So we would have organic farmers who were growing cover crops and I was like, hey man, why don't you just plant an acre of wheat over there? <laughs> I'll come get it for you. And, um, and that's kind of how I got started with into the wheat business. Um, we had a couple farms that were willing to, like, do wheat. One of our best crops is actually oats. Um, and so people love oats. Um, I would have farmers grow a few acres of oats and, and we'd figure out a way to split it. Um, so in the corn and bean planting, um, I use a pretty basic method. I got a, so this is, this little tractor here is the tractor I use. It's a Carrero, um, Italian tractor. So that's actually a 90 horsepower tractor. It has a lot of the, the lift capacity of much ye bigger tractors, but I can haul it around uh, with my truck easily. Uh, there's a company in Pennsylvania called Peckway Planter, and they recycle old John Deere planters, and they can create any configuration you need from a one row planter all the way up to, you know, eight, ten rows, whatever you have scale for. This model is no-till ready, so I can experiment uh, with some no-till. Um, it's just a vacuum planter, which means that the a vacuum is used to pick up the seed, and then it drops the seed, so it makes for pretty accurate planting. Um, there's other models out there. This is a Machio corn and bean planter. That's a brand new one. Um, I think the Peckway planters, you can get them, some of them, if you don't do the vacuum seeded, you can probably get a planter for like three or $4,000, where something like this is closer to like ten or 15000 so the corn that we do, we do a dent corn. Um, our best-selling corn is actually popcorn. Um, we do a Japanese hullless popcorn. And, it, and what that means is it doesn't have a hull on it. 
And so the popcorn doesn't get stuck in people's teeth. And so it's a really popular item at the market uh, that people come back for. Um, the dent corn that we do, this variety, I think, is uh, Rebellion. And um, Rebellion is, so in our area, we're really right next to, like, one of the biggest USDA research facilities, like, I think, in the nation in Beltsville. But, so they do a lot of research on, on, you know, GMOs there. So Rebellion actually has the gene from popcorn in it, so it doesn't cross-pollinate with um, GMO corns. And so occasionally we get people at the market and, you know, they understand um, that the sort of cross-pollination thing and they ask us how we uh, make sure that we're not growing GMO corn. Um, so, but that's our answer. So we do the rebellion. Um, and from the corn, you can get cornmeal, you can get corn grits, and you get corn flour. Actually, the way it works is you get corn grits, which is the bigger ones, <laughs> and then you get the corn uh, meal, which is sort of in the middle, and then you get the corn flour. What's the ratio usually when you mill it? Yeah, so 40% grits, 10% meal, and then another, like, 40 to 50% uh, flour. Um, so this is my buddy Heinz. He's using an old uh, harvester, pull-type harvester. He's got, so he's, he just bought a combine this year, but he must have five or six of these. And they're all in different states of <laughs> repair or disrepair. And so on any given day, he might, to harvest the field, he might have to use one, two, or three of them, depending on how things go in the field. Um, if you run one of these, you have to have some level of, of skill in terms of being able to repair equipment, light welding skills help out. Um, and, you know, you can find some in pretty good condition, but depending on how hard you use them, stuff breaks down. Um, so, unfortunately for us, we don't have a combine yet that actually harvests corn. So the plots that we do, this year I think we did like an acre and we regretted it. Um, <laughs> so we, we did hand harvest about an acre, uh, no, more like a half acre of the popcorn, and we probably took in about a half acre of the, the dent corn. So when you have to harvest corn by hand, it makes it a lot um, more of a task. What Heinz has done here, he's actually, oh, hold on, I'll go back. He's taken, he's taken a, um, not a weed eater, but a, a trimmer, and he's cut off the top of his plants, and then he's harvesting right below where the corn itself is so that he does not run in a whole bunch of dry material through the combine. So it's still a, a task, and I think he does like maybe two or three acres of corn. So... This is a basic corn sheller. This was us this year with our hand harvested. So basically we put it away where we let it dry for a while and then we come, this is an old John Deere corn sheller and this is popcorn. So, and from that we run it through the seed cleaner and there's not much else you need to do with the popcorn, it's actually pretty clean, so there's not much hand picking from the popcorn. So the next item that we'll talk about is dry beans. So this is the newest thing for us. Um, the, so the first thing you got to do is find seed. Um, a lot of the seed companies have dry beans. You kind of got to get them early. 
Um, at this point, I think what we have to switch over to is actually um, you basically seed saving. Um, but these are so what we're we're trying to combine our beans. All of these beans work with a combine, right? So we use bush variety beans that work with a combine. Uh, if you're going to harvest by hand, then you can use all of the vining beans. Um, if you hand harvest, um, it's a lot of work to hand harvest beans, but if you got just a, a family garden or a small scale backyard garden, then you can do some good hand harvesting. Beans are like jewels. They're like, like having a handful of beans with all the amazing shapes in your hand, it, it's really fulfilling to, to grow uh, dry beans. Um, just going through the field, usually I walk through the field and look at the mat different maturity levels on the different bean varieties that we have and end up picking a pocket full of beans and, and playing with them. Uh, sometimes we make shapes with them around the house. But the varieties that we like are Rosa de Luca. Tiger's Eye is probably one of the top sellers. Um, it's actually a really great bean. Uh, early Warwick is a variety that we found, um, and Early Warwick and Whipple look almost, ex they are exactly the same except for the size um, in terms of the look. Um, so Early Warwick, the Whipple, Early Warwick is a much shorter season bean. Um, Berlotti, which we didn't know anything about. We actually, I thought I had some early Warwick and I planted them and we ended up with Barlotti as, <laughs> and we didn't know anything about them. But it turns out that people love Barlotti. I would say that the Barlottis might outsell the tiger's eye um, at the market. So it is, what is it, an Italian bean? and a lot of people know about the Barlotti and they love them. So we had no idea that it would be a hit. We didn't even know what we grew. Um, so, but we end up with a, a really nice bean. There's a bean called Yellow Indian Woman and what's the other one that is the same as the, the Yellow Indian Woman is a Swedish bean. Um, Oli? Olin is another bean that looks just like the yellow Indian woman that you might be able to find. Um, Jacob's cattle. Jacob's cattle, um, I'll show you what that field looked like. The easiest uh, to harvest beans are the black turtle and the pinto beans. And so, and then there's another variety that we grow called brystone. I'm probably missing one or two varieties up here. Um, and so what you want in a bean, what we're, what bean breeders uh, breed for is upright disposition, right? So you can have a plant that will basically be upright throughout the growing season um, and is going to maintain the pods of the beans above the ground. So what happens with beans, um, and, and so let me mention that most of the bean production we've done up to this point, um, we did do two fields this year that were like primary season that we started it in early June, but most of our bean production is on the backside. It's a second cropping from a, a grain, an overwintering grain harvest. So we're starting our beans in late, uh, June and up to mid-July. Um, I think that we would actually come up with some better harvest numbers if we actually try them as sort of the, the primary crop for the year. So those are some considerations to make. Um, I'll show you some of the, the issues that we had, but so the upright position, if the beans, what will happen with something like black beans? So there's, there, in the bean realm, there's determinants and indeterminates. Ideally, you get something that's a determinant where it'll set all its pods and everything dries down at the same time, right? That's the best. 
with a lot of the black beans, I know the black beans that you get from high mowing and some of the other black turtle beans, like every time it rains, they get new green growth. And so in the end, you end up with some um, ripe pods on the bottom, and then you got new growth at the top. So from a harvesting perspective for mechanical equipment, it's almost impossible to combine something like that. Um, so you got to consider like dry down time in the field. So, so now our solution to that, so what do we have here? These are, whoosh. I don't know how that works. All right, back up. So I think around the edges are the Berlotti, the Jacobs cattle, Rosa de Luca are these. This is, these are the Swedish beans. In the middle there are some early Warwick. Um, it's just a few varieties. So this is how the field looks. So we plant, uh, usually we're seeding about, you know, I don't know numbers per acre, um, usually I'm setting my cedar where we can, or my planter, to where I'm planting uh, about an inch and a half to two inches apart. So the beans are pretty close together, I think. And then for me, my in-between row spacing is at 28 inches. Um, it could probably be just a little bit closer because you really want your fields to like shade everything out. Um, that would be ideal, but 28 inches is what works for us. And so you really want to fill up that field with as many bean plants as you can. So you can see what that looks like probably after one cultivation there. So one of the issues that I have, this is coming behind a rye crop. So you know rye is really tall. There's a lot of residue on the ground. And so we're seeding into this residue. And then we have to come back and figure out ways to cultivate until the residue is, is resolved. So more beans growth cycle. So cultivation is, I'm sure that you could do some of this in a no-till cycle. Beans are probably one of the crops that you could probably do with no-till um, if you actually um, did a roller crimper. Because um, they come through, they're pretty hardy plants, they grow really fast, they'll come up fast. Um, it's something that we're working on, getting a good stand so that we can do a experiment with a no-till stand. Um, I think, why am I doing this? Because posts are not, wood is not conductive. Why do I need an insulator on a wood post? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> why do you? <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> <laughs> Cultivation is essential. So in a high residue situ situation, we use something kind of like a basket weeder. I do have a basket weeder. Uh, a lot of the older traditional cultivation equipment is useful. Uh, we use some precision. Uh, I use what's called a Q-ho system, which is a Japanese cultivation system. Um, because that actually helps with, it does in-row weeding. I'll show you what it is. Um, so I went through the, I actually got basket weeders, but we didn't end up needing basket weeders because we use these weeders, uh, which are similar to a basket weeder, and this works in a high residue situation. Um, but you can see the, the Japanese weeders are a torsentine weeder, and this is kind of off center of the row, but ideally um, this would be right in the middle of the row of the plant, and those tine weeders are coming right in between the plants, and it does a really good job at in-row weeding as well as in between the rows. 
Um, how y'all like my little tractor? I bet y'all haven't seen many like that. Uh, this is the QHO sort of lineup. They make one that you can, uh, is a push hoe um, that does the same work. And you can see here how these times kind of cross over where your plant is. And you're getting in row weeding along with uh, the between. Um, this is the one over there that I use on the beans. And this one on the right is used for some of the grains. Uh, this is Larry at work on some corn. So with this setup, I can run an acre in just a few minutes. We can run through three or four acres in an hour. And so you can see this is probably going to be the last cultivation that we do on this. Um, as far as hand weedings, usually each field will go through and do at least one hand weeding. We've had instances where we haven't had to do any hand weeding. Um, and so you can see Sometimes you, you watch your cultivators go through the field and you wonder if you're going to have any plants left. Um, but in this case, with the beans, they're pretty sturdy. So the idea with the beans is to plant them as deeply as possible. Um, usually I'm dropping them down about an inch, an inch and a half, so that when they come up, they can withstand the tine weeders. Um, if the more shallow you put them, the less uh, extreme you can be with your cultivation tools. This is uh, another one of these little Japanese tractors. So this is probably definitely the last cultivation on this crop. Of beans. This was actually our uh, tiger's eye beans for this year. And so the goal is to have a canopy that kind of looks like this. You want everything to get covered, and eventually this all covers in, and then you don't have to worry about anything. And there's no weeds coming through there at that point. Um, and if you got a good strain of beans, they stay upright and they're easily harvestable. So that's what it looks like kind of underneath. Um, this was our pinto beans. You can see like a nice set on these pinto beans. Um, so here, these are black beans. Um, that was a row of early Warwick that somehow I uh, end up putting in between, and those are the pinto beans over there. So over on this side, we have an acre of black beans. We had an acre of Jacob's cattle. That was an acre of the pinto beans. And so in total, I think we had about five or six acres of bean production. Um, and so the next part of this, so you can see uh, black beans, Jacob's cattle, pinto beans, and this were mixed beans. This is one of our beans plots, and then we had two acres of beans at another site. Um, I don't know what variety this was, but you can kind of see what you're looking for. Beans are so beautiful, and at the same time, it can when they get close to harvest, it's one of the ugliest crops. See what it looks like when it's drying down. <laughs> um, and so this is not quite ready to harvest. There's still some green in here. Every, you can see this. Combines don't like that kind of stuff. Um, 
And unfortunately, with the beams, we don't always get the combine. So what we come to is that with some of the beams, um, I think this is from a year ago. There, we've learned. So I think three years ago, we had a beautiful uh, field of tiger's eye. And they were, it was actually a first, we didn't, it wasn't a second cropping. It was done in June, and they were about ready when the first uh, um, tropical system decided to come through. And so we knew, um, so half of the beans on there were dried down, and there was a few pods at the top, but part of the plant was still green, so I knew we couldn't get to it. So in the end, the rain hit it, and all the beans that, were, that are done end up sprouting because of the rain. You can't let those beans stay in the pot on the plants for three or four days, and you get three or four days of rain. They're going to start sprouting in the pot. And so that field, we ended up harvesting by hand. We let what we could dry down. And interestingly, all the beans that were on the ground re-sprouted and produced another crop. And so we got two crops out of one. I'm sure we would appreciate it having one complete crop, but we got two partial crops out of the one, which might have been better than the one by itself. Um, but all that to say, sometimes we handpick, and this is what it looks like, right? So we're pulling, this is a little bit early even for handpicking. But it doesn't matter, like if you see half, most of your beans are, are just about ready. There could be some beans that are completely green on the pod. When you pull the plants, you put them in a dry spot. So this is in a hoop house. Um, usually we try to put them above ground. We're not layering them too deeply. Now we put them in a windrow um, and we make sure the air is going. And sometimes we flip them over. But all the beans that are in the pot are going to mature all the way. Usually it takes a week or two. Um, if they're really green, it might take two or three weeks. But you can get those beans to sort of dry down all the way. And then we, we hand feed them into the combine. Um, this was our black bean field this year. It was a nightmare. Um, this is my son with a, what is that called? Um, a hedge trimmer. <laughs> and so he was walking down the rows. We could tell where the rows were. And black beans can be very, we tried a different variety this year than we did before. So most of the bean production in America is coming out of uh, North Dakota, Idaho, um, up there in the Midwest. Um, and so that's where all of the bean breeding is done. Um, so, and they do this whole upright structure. So we got some new beans from North Dakota, and they end up being a variety that did a lot of vining. And so we had to go through and separate them so that we could actually run the combine through there and get the beans out of the field. And so I don't think, so our timing was off. Black beans from now on, we're going to do in early June. We're not going to wait till mid-June or July. We're going to give black beans their full season and do them only as a, a first crop. Um, just because they need to be able to dry down in the field. And this year, what happened was we got a storm in right as they were about ready, and it rained for three or four days, and which wasn't bad because none of the pods are open, they're all off the ground, but it got cool. And once it got cool, that meant that it wasn't going to dry down any further. And so, because the ground was cool and wet, and it just sat there. So it took another, what should have been harvested within four or five days took almost another month in the field, right? 
So if we'd had better timing, that would not have happened. This is what the uh, pinto beans look like before harvest. Um, that's beautiful because the combine just runs through that easily and you end up with a bin full of beans. This is Amanda and uh, Viraga here. They're picking one of the varieties by hand. And this is what we've been doing this year. So of the five or six acres that we did, we probably had to hand harvest three of them. Um, so we pull them out of the fields, we put them in piles, we windrow them, and, and then we let this dry for two or three weeks and we come back and we run them through the combine. Now, most of you are like, that's a lot of work. But at the markets, our price for beans is $8 to $13 a pound. And so we have no problems People love the beans. It's one of our biggest sales, and uh, people don't mind paying that. We have another farmer who has a big farmer grow some organic beans for him. He offers um, the beans at, I think it's like $7 for two pounds. He sells them in a closed bag, and uh, if you look in that bag, it's going to take you about probably about an hour to, to clean them if not more. So people appreciate the fact that we are hand, you know, we hand sort all of our beans before they go to sale. And if you do that, then you can get the price that you need to get. That's more bean production. This hoof house was a savior. Uh, we did some out in the field. Um, that's the Barlotti. So we probably reused this hoop house three or four, three times this year, three different sets. Again, uh, that looks like the, oh, I know, that was us. So that sparse was the Jacob's cattle. I would not recommend doing another acre of Jacob's cattle. That's kind of what the combine looks like in the, our harvesting operation. So we put them in bags. That's a seed cleaner that we're running it through. And then that's, we run it through the cleaner, that's going through a conveyor, and then we're dropping it down into a dryer that we dry the beans. So both bean and grains, you have to, we need to talk about um, drying. That was the Jacob's cattle, and this is a pinto bean. So that's my little combine. It's a Japanese combine. Um, we have two different Japanese combines. One we use for rice, the other one's an all-purpose. So this one, I can harvest from the lima beans all the way down to quinoa or amaranth. Um, we haven't tried teff yet, but um, we have done mustard seed. That's one of our, our the seeds that we grow. Um, and it's very simple. This combine, you change out a sieve on it, and you also, you need to, there's a, a belt two pulleys and a, a belt that needs to be changed out. So it's about to, to switch between beans and grains really only takes about maybe 15, 20 minutes. So it's real easy compared to uh, the previous combine that we had. This is black beans. I'm not sure what that is, but this, this is how it looks when they come out of the combine before the seed cleaner. That's the tiger's eye. People really, really love the tiger's eye. Oh, we tried lentils. And um, it was interesting. Um, I don't think we're gonna try it again, but we tried lentils. So 
in this experiment that we did, it was a mixture. Lentils um, are an overwintering crop, or it can be a really early, kind of like, um, what's the, the pea, the, the fava beans? It's an early spring production. Um, if you can get in there early, early in the spring. So what we did here, and you'll see um, mixed in with that, is some soft wheat. Um, I probably should have done about 90% lentils and 10% wheat. What we did was a 60-40 ratio, and the wheat just kind of outgrew the lentils. So even though we got some lentils, the wheat, um, in the end, we could not separate <laughs> the wheat from the lentils. We tried everything that we know, and we couldn't figure out how we could separate the wheat from the lentils. So we ended up with a pot of lentils off of our quarter acre um, of, of production. So you can see this was harvesting some beans that we harvested at night, but um, the bean, the pods on their plants were ready, but this is what happens when the rain just won't quit. You still get some green on your plants, but you can get it through the combine. My combine kind of has a, there's a one section on the, uh, there's a recirculating auger, and if that gets clogged up, it means that you can't get through that field because it's going to just keep getting clogged up, and then you end up spending more time cleaning the combine than you can harvesting. So that's kind of the measure. But in this case, uh, the field that we had did not cl clog up that auger, but you end up with some of these green pieces in with the, uh, the beans. And that's all easily separated out with the seed cleaner, but this is what it looked like out of the combine. This is brystone, which is a different, it looks kind of like a pinto bean. Rosa de Luca. All right. So we're going to talk now about small grains. So wheat. Most people are familiar with wheat. Uh, the market out there, most of the market for wheat is with the hard wheat. Hard wheat is used um, in bread production versus the soft wheat, which is used in pastry production. So the hard wheat is going to have the higher protein content that the bakers like, um, and the soft wheat is going to be more of a, you know, ideally most folk like a white soft wheat because it makes things look like white flour, um, but they're actually using a whole wheat. Um, and in general, soft wheat production is going to be a lot better than hard wheat production in terms of... Um, tonnage per acre. Um, both soft and hard wheats have winter overwintering varieties, or you can do a spring variety. Um, for some reason, it's easier to do an overwintering variety, which means you're starting off in October or November. Um, I've seen a farmer next to me who he gets his stuff in just before December. Um, he's a big chemical farmer, but he, he'll just seed in the middle of winter. Um, I think the cutoff date where we are in Maryland is supposed to be October 15th for cover crops and getting in winter grains. Um, but we've definitely um, seeded all the way in through November. Uh, and still gotten good yields. Um, but these are some considerations. Uh, what else about the wheat? So the so most of our wheat that we grow ends up going to so our sales are the farmers markets. We do um, supplements in how many CSAs? About five or six CSAs have us as an add-on. Um, COVID has actually been great for us in terms of um, food uh, distribution channels because all these channels have opened up. Um, 
And usually it's actually not for wheat. It's for something more like the beans or the rice, the oats. Oats are a really big seller for us. So, um, all right. So to continue with this, barley is done in the spring. Uh, a lot of the brewers like the barley. We use barley for grain. We're not interested in, in alcohol so much as a food crop. Um, rye is an overwintering. So that's... Uh, Another crop that we do, I usually try to just get in maybe a half acre or an acre of rye. The demand for rye is, is not that high, um, even though rye is probably one of the best grains for us. Um, oats, the variety that we do is a hullus oat called streaker. There's a couple different hullus varieties out there. So oats are by far the itchiest grain you know, in natural medicine, herbalism, even in home remedies, oats are used to do what? Stop itching. <laughs> in the field, oats are the itchiest thing that you will ever come across. And they, I mean, you should see some of the, I've almost suffocated myself trying to run from oats. <laughs> I remember <laughs> <laughs> One year, I, I, I bought this plastic suit because I thought I could get away from the itch if I just insulated myself and, like, have just my face out, right, because my combine's open. And I went around the field a couple times. I was drinking water, drinking water, and then I just, you know, I was like one of those people out there in the midsummer day with one of those, like, suits on and... You know, I started getting dizzy, so I knew it wasn't going to last for much longer. <laughs> so, so anyway, oats are very itchy. You need to consider that. The dust from oats is, is really itchy. It's amazing how oats are used for itching, and yet it is the itchiest grain that you will ever come across. Um, and again, so hullus means that the oats don't have a hull on it. So normally the grain production for oats, like Quaker oats and all these oatmeal that you find, they're using a hulled variety. They steam it and then they run it through a huller and then they roll the oats, right? With the hullus variety, we run, I'll show you the process that we do to run it through the cleaners. But once we, so even though it says hullus, you still have two or three percent in there that's going to have hulls on it, right? So the last thing anybody wants when they're eating a bowl of oats is to, to chomp down on some of the hulls. So if you're a home uh, gardener and, you know, you chomp down on some and your oats, just knowing that you grow those oats are enough, but a lot of people don't like, you know, chomping down on the hulls. So we go through a, a lengthy process to get the hulls out of the oats. And so, but, but with the hullest oats, we can offer a product which is just raw oats because we don't have to steam them. So all that we do is run them through the roller and then we have uh, the hullest oats. And the beauty of the hullest oats, you know, grains have been gotten this bad reputation but we breeded out a lot of the, you know, back when fats got this bad name, I don't know if it was in the 70s or the 80s, but there was this whole, like, to this, this campaign to breed fats out of the grains, right? And so where does the flavor come from, right? When you add a stick of butter to something, you know, it, it's coming from the fat. So these oats have a really high fat profile. So they really, people love the taste because the oats contain more fat. And so there's another grain that people grow. I think, um, what was his name? Jack, um, up in the Northeast, he wrote Organic Grain Grower. He recommends another variety because of the itchiness of the, the streaker variety that we use. So you can look up that variety. Um, I think it's coming out of Canada, um, and it's, it's been harder for us to find. We have another farmer in our market who does some Hullis oats. He grows the other variety, but I think people are pretty split. I think we get more sales for ours, but we can't figure out if it's because of the taste of the variety or his 
um, lack of cleaning skills um, in terms of people buying oats that have um, the, the hull still in it. So rice is a summer crop that we, we basically grow rice as a specialty crop. Um, we'll get to the rice production. Um, so we got sorghum, we got millet. That's up, which those are African grains. They grow well in, uh, in, in drought type climates. So if you got a dry situation and you're looking to grow a grain, sorghum and millet are there. Um, the rice, the sorghum, the millet, those summer grains, you gotta be really aware of like what your bird pressure is gonna be, because birds love all of them. Uh, buckwheat, which we all know is a cover crop, you can grow into um, a grain. Buckwheat is one of those sort of gluten-free grains that uh, is an alternative that we can sell at the market. Uh, Buckwheat does not want to dry down, so it's one of those ever-growing things that, you know, can turn into a real weed problem on the farm. Uh, so if you don't, you have to consider that when you grow buckwheat as a grain that you might always have it in that field. And having buckwheat, I never thought of buckwheat as a weed until we have buckwheat as a weed. Um, and so sesame is also another grain that we sort of, I think they call it benet um, in the African tradition, but the sesame is another consideration for grains. Um, so the rice, we do dryland rice um, or upland. Uh, that was the first grain that we did. And so what we did was look up, you know, what people have doing. How I saw a rice presentation in North Carolina um, where a young man and it, uh, a couple, they had a SARE grant, and it was a, like a three-year grant to do um, SRI, production of rice, in, in North Carolina. On their second year, it didn't rain. There was a drought. So what he did was he took his seedlings, and he planted them in the ground, and he used drip tape, and he ended up getting a better harvest from the drip tape than he did in his patty. So I was like, I could do that. <laughs> so that's how we ended up really after that presentation, I saw how I could do it with the equipment that I had. And so the whole premise, so this is the different stages of the rice plant growth. So the whole premise of the system of rice intensification is based on um, plant spacing, so ideally, you have plants that are spaced, um, I think it's 25 centimeters is the ideal on the grid. So that's about, I think, 11 inches apart. Um, and so in our space, we're doing it like a row crop. We lay, so our experiment in the beginning was growing rice um, using biodegradable mulch. So we. Back then, I think it was Bio 360 or whatever we were getting from France. Um, and we basically did it with drip tape. Um, and so on our row, we have like a 30, a 28 inch bed on the top. And we have three rows of rice with two lines of drip tape. And the spacing in between the plants is I think on the, the wheel that we use now. So right now we use a two bad cats wheel. So in our rice production, I don't know if we have any pictures in here. We have, we have tractor equipment to do this, but we choose to do it by hand. So on a acre field, I think it's about 42,000 plants per acre of transplant. So the whole system of rice intensification is that we're actually using transplants so regular rice production is about, you know, the old school rice production, which when they air seed rice, that's at like 100 pounds to 200 pounds per acre, right? Uh, with a seeder, I think they got that down to like 80 pounds per acre. With what we're doing, it's about uh, two pounds per acre, right? Because we're seeding in trays, we use flats that are... Uh, we used to do 108s. Um, that's a little 
big, well, it actually got to be a little expensive, but we switched to the 200 um, deep cell trays. So you, you want to have the deep cells. Uh, if you use the small cells, you're just going to root bound them quicker. So the whole idea of, of SRI is that you want to start them individually, and you're transplanting individual rice transplants before they start to tiller. So usually that's around day 20 to 24, right? So you want to transplant them into the ground so that they'll, before they start to tiller. So a tiller means that you start to get these side shoots, right? And each side shoot is going to produce a, a spikelet. And then those spikelets will produce are basically will produce pods of rice, right? And so on a good plant with good tillering, you can get from, you know, 30 to, I've seen claims of up to 100 tillers on a plant. So you give the rice plant space, and then the plant will, will be really, um, how can I say, productive, right? And so you want to ink maximum uh, productivity from your plant. So this is what a field looks like. This is probably a few weeks after. So what I just said, we use a mulch layer, 11 inches between each of the rows, eight inches between the plants. Ideally, you can do 25 centimeters. Um, so, in our system, we always are inoculating with stuff. So we're using beneficial microbes and mycorrhizal inoculants. I mean, so, so in a rice paddy, rice plants in a paddy don't need to grow any root system whatsoever because they can grow all of, get all of the nutrients that they need from the top five centimeters or, no, no, top, it's like millimeters in the soil, right? Because in a rice paddy, you get, um, I think it's a reduction reaction, so it draws all of the oxygen out of the system, which then makes all of your phosphorus and your potassium available. And so the plants don't really have to put out much of a root system to get those nutrients, right? Um, but you do have issues with nitrogen mobilization in that system. So in this case, we're using an aerobic process. We don't get to the anaerobic process. We're not trying to mimic an anaerobic process. We're really trying to uh, find varieties that grow well in this system. And what we found in our rice production, this is us transplanting some rice. Um, I want to be conscious of the time that we have. Um, so, so you could see this is Heinz's field. He's using uh, five foot plastic and he's got four rows, right? And I think his spacing is seven inches apart. Um, and so if on his transplanter, there's two people laying down there that are doing the transplanting and they're doing uh, quality control coming behind. And so this is what uh, transplanting at his farm looks like. On our farm, we're pushing that two bad cats roller. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it takes us really, last year it took us maybe uh, three or four days to get it all in. Um, Heinz, it takes a, maybe a day to get his fields in. Um, we've tried direct seeding. This is with, uh, um, this was a field that we were actually able to direct seed and bring all the way to harvest. Um, I know what I was going to say. So with the rice, in the beginning, we could only find, like, where's the rice seed, right? If you go and you Google rice seed, nothing comes up. I mean, now you get a few varieties from Baker Creek. 
I think they were offering a variety that from they claim was from South America. Um, what was the place up in the Northeast? Huh? Yeah, oh, they had Blue Bonnet. Um, what's the place in Maine? What's that? Fedco had a couple varieties, the Duborskian variety. So Duborskian is a is a like a Russian or Ukrainian variety. And it's a true dryland rice variety, but it doesn't tiller well. So the, the two varieties that we could get in the beginning was the Duborskian and another variety called um, Koshiakari, which is a Japanese sushi variety, which we were getting from Kitazawa seed. And then I really Googled. And I kept Googling. And finally, I found some Chinese seed company that shipped me a whole bunch of seed. <laughs> and, so, and so in China, dryland rice production is actually mostly found in the biggest rice, dryland rice production comes out of Brazil. And it's not a good situation because when they clear the rainforest, rice happens to be a plant that can tolerate pHs that are really acidic. And so when they clear the rainforest, before they come in with their grain production or their pasture, they grow a crop of rice. Um, and so that's where you have a lot of research on a lot of the dryland rice production um, is out of Brazil. But you have rice has been produced in most brown-skinned people's culture from the ocean, from uh, sort of an aquatic situation. Um, you know, when you look at what happened down in South, in, in South Carolina, what they were mimicking was a system that came right from West Africa. When the Europeans first what came up to Africa, all of their mangroves were covered in rice paddies. And a lot of that transitioned right over to South Carolina. They actually took their slaves from those production systems and brought them straight to South Carolina. And when slavery ended in, or the bringing in new slaves ended in 1815, those slaves were sold into Louisiana for the rice production systems in Louisiana. Um, but it came from skilled labor. So anywhere you had brown people, you had rice production all the way from the coastlines up into the mountains. So in China, they do dryland rice in the mountains. In places like Thailand, Indonesia, you find like uh, dryland rice varieties. So the difference, the, the point to all of this is what we found is like the Koshiakari, if we had drip tape and when we laid the, if we laid the plastic and it was wet and there was a ziggly line in the, in the drip tape, right? The Koshiakari couldn't even, get its roots over to where the drip tape was. And so we would have a plant that was close to the drip tape that was completely healthy, and then we have a plant next to that and it was dwarfed out. It couldn't even reach over to get the water. It didn't put out enough root systems to get to the water. And so I think now that's changed a little bit because we've been saving our seed from the Koshiakari and it's become a little bit more resilient. But you want to think about that when you consider seed varieties, because a lot of the varieties that we can get. Um, so I ended up, we ended up having a collaboration, or not a collaboration, but we contacted the USDA Rice Research Center in Arkansas. Uh, the lady's name is Anna McClung. She controls the GRIN, which is the seed bank for the rice, and she's willing to send anybody in this room a packet of rice um, to grow. And so one year she asked me for some Duborskian, right? And so I sent her a Duborskian and we had this, it was a number of variety from China, HD 502. And so I sent her some of the HD 502. And so she called me up. She was like, hey, do you know importing rice seed is illegal? <laughs> and I'm the sheriff. And so I was like, oh no. <laughs> So, so she said, look, from now on, you tell me what you need, and I'll make sure I, like, get it to you. I'll do my best to get you what you need, but, you know, this stuff really needed to be quarantined, right? So I was like, sure, because we know people 
who go out of the country and they come back with rice all the time, like, you know, for seed. And so we get offers like that. So Anna McClung is a good resource um, for rice seed if you're considering rice production. All right, so I'll move on. Um, this looks like Jupiter or some, huh? Koshi Akari? All right. And so that variety, I mean, it's, rice is a beautiful plant. This is, we do a black rice. So at the market, we do five or six varieties of rice. We do a black rice, we do a red rice, we do a Del Monte, which is um, uh, a, is a, like a aromatic variety or a basmati variety. So true basmati varieties take their day, what they call daily, day sensitive, which means it takes about six months for them to come all the way into production. So we don't have that type of time frame, and that's something else you want to consider is how long the grow season is for whatever variety you have. We thought that, you know, long grain would be longer season, but that's not really how it works. They have some long grain varieties that are short season. There's short grain varieties that are very long season. So um, this one is a, a variety called Tiara, which they bred for production because of the uh, proanthocyanin, the antioxidant content in the rice. Um, and people love it. This one, it doesn't have a high um, yield on it. So let's talk yield on rice. So our best varieties in, so regular rice production in patty is about 8,000 pounds per acre. Um, dryland rice production uh, is about half of that, so about 4,000 pounds per acre. And that is with our system that we have. So we're not counting just the tops of the beds, we're counting the whole acre, right? And so um, the best varieties that we've had are around five to 5,500 pounds per acre. A variety like this, if you get 2,000 pounds per acre, you might be doing really good. It's probably more like 1,500 pounds per acre. But we charge for this variety, I think, $15 a pound, and we sell out of it most each year. I think this year we were able to grow about eight or 900 pounds of it, so it did really well for the, I think we had a quarter acre of it. Um, so that's a rice combine that I use. Uh, importing used Japanese equipment is kind of tricky. Diesel engines need to be over 20 years to get them into the country. Gas engines you can buy brand new, um, but you can't resell them. Um, so all of these combines that we get are old used equipment. They've been used in the field. I ended up getting a connection with a Japanese. Um, I mean, I was just calling Japan until somebody picked up the phone who was able to speak English. And so, and it worked out. So he actually lived, or his shop was near an Iseki dealership. And the Iseki dealer in Japan, their whole system of rice production is community-based, right? Their, their whole production system stays in the community. So a lot of it is a co-op or a collective. So this combine that we got actually came from a dealership and it was one that they had as a loaner and they kept it up so they knew the, the records, uh, the, the maintenance records for it. So that's kind of what it looks like. You know, we prepare for this and look forward to this every year. And it seems like no matter what we do, when we get to it, we can't not rush. And so it's amazing how that works. And so, and as you know, every time you rush, something bad happens. Um, but this year, it was pretty good. We got through our harvest pretty well. We actually had the worst rice year ever. Um, I got excited when we got this plot. Um, 
This is a 15-acre clearing right next to a riverbed, right next to a river. So this is really sandy soil. Um, when we got the land, I got really excited. So I made out the, the, the field and got it all prepared, and I laid all the mulch. And the next morning, I was driving in. So one of the biggest issues that we have with rice is a disease called rice blast. Rice blast happens if you have drought, if you have, don't have morning sun. What? Okay, if you don't have morning sun, uh, if it gets too cool, there's a whole lot of reasons, and blast is ubiquitous, so it's everywhere, right? And so I ended up putting the field here, and I came in at like 8 o'clock in the morning the next day, and I was like, well, wait a minute. The shade was there, and it did not get shady until like 9. So I, I knew from the beginning that might be a problem. So you want to make sure if you plant rice, you put it in a place where it does not get morning sun. So this is a rice huller. This is a small unit. This, this one hulls, and it also whitens. We never use the whitening function on it. Uh, we sell whole grain brown rice. So if you don't know, when you take the hull off of the rice, it's automatically brown rice unless you grew a red or black variety. And then to get to white rice, you have to take the hull off it, much like you have to do wheat or any of the other grains that, that people denude and take the, the nutrition off um, for the starch. You know, it's interesting what I was going to say this morning. This whole idea of white bread... White bread was initially for the royalty. White rice was initially for the royalty, right? And so when poor people were able to afford, I mean, they had to eat the hard stuff, the good stuff. And then when all this stuff got machinated, they gave it to the poor people, and it ruined everybody's health. And so... The same goes with rice, except there is a benefit if you're in Louisiana to eating white rice because if rice picks up arsenic or cadmium, and so in a, in a um, patty situation, it can pick up arsenic. In a dryland situation, it can pick up cadmium. So you have to be aware We've tested our rice. We've never come up with any heavy metals. I think growing biologically um, and staying away from fermented situations have kept the heavy metals away. Um, and the fact that none of the land, we've been fortunate in none of the lands that we've grown in, you got to be aware, like, the old tobacco lands, the places where they used uh, the fungicides 100 years ago, um, uh, still contain all these heavy metals in the ground. So this is a, uh, the rice huller that we use. All right, that's the grain drill that I use for grains. I use a rotary harrow instead of a... Um, so a rotary harrow is different than a tiller in that the rotary harrow does not invert the soil. And then I'm putting it on the seed. Uh, before that, I used just a simple um, spin spreader on the back of the tractor. I did that for years. Um, and so the new thing that we do, if we do um, fall plants and stuff, is come through with a tine weeder one or two times. And that will clean up your fields going through the winter, and you get a nice stand the next year. Um, this is a boom sprayer that I use. This puts, has a 45-foot boom on it. This kind of arms out, and then the arms both extend. This has been great for our foliar sprays and moving to a more biological farming so we can apply our sprays, our foliar sprays, to a, a, like I can do four or five acres with one tank. The tank on here is like a hundred and, I want to say about 140 gallons. 
Uh, so that's a, what one of our worst wheat fields look like. You can see some weeds in there. That's me in those weeds, getting them out. Um, that's a hard red. So the hard red wheats are like Expedition, Turkey Red, Redeemer, Red Fife. Uh, wheat varieties. The white wheat is Appalachian. Another one that we, um, no, okay. So soft red. We grow Arisman, uh, which we don't have a big market for. The soft whites are more popular. The Frederick, Alice, and Harris. And it's not Harris, it's H-A-R-U-S. And then a, a really nice one that the bakers like is the Bowles, which is a hard red spring wheat, which is a, um, has a pretty high protein profile. Uh, the streaker variety on the oats. This is what oats look like at their height. Um, that's the hazelnut rye. A bruisey rye can be rolled similar to um, the, the oats. We have one of our vendors that does rolled rye. Um, barley is a spring planet. People can use it in the, the, the soups and salads and different ways that we teach people how to use whole grains in their diet. Um, the lentils, sorghum and millet. This is a mustard feel, mustard feel, mustards coming out of the combine, buckwheat coming out of the combine, um, corn, harvesting, sorghum. Oh, this is how a combine works. So basically, it's stripping, it's taking in the grain, and then you have some mechanism that's stripping away the grain from the chaff. The grain falls to the bottom down here. So you have your first arger, which the cleanest grain comes up out of, and behind that you have a recirculating auger, which... Uh, basically runs all the, the grain back into the cylinder for a second and gets the rest of the grain off of the chaff. Um, that was my first combine. Uh, so when we first started, we didn't know how we would harvest. We thought we was gonna harvest all this rice by hand. We thought we could go out there with a, a sickle and just harvest by hand an acre of rice. And, so what we looked at first was like a, a, a thresher, um, like a lot of the Amish have threshers and things like that. Um, and so anyway, I was looking around and I think one of the grain companies, the man called me back, he was like, hey man, I don't have a thresher, but he said, tell me what you do. And I told him what we did. He said, I like what I hear, so I got this used research combine and I'll give it to you for what I paid for it. So I ended up getting this thing for, I think it was like five or six thousand dollars. But this was a monster to calibrate. Like calibrating this took a lot of time and it's like you had to change the concave and do all kinds of stuff to it to switch in between crops and it's about 12 feet high, but only five feet wide. So when you stopped, it would tip forward. <laughs> and it was really scary to operate. So we got, we uh, were able to sell it off and, and move to the Japanese equipment. So you can see sort of, this is the Japanese combine. This is a pretty fast unit. I'm harvesting, I think that's some, that's the turkey red right there. So it takes me a while to get through a field, but I can do it pretty fast. It takes me a while because I've got a five foot header, but I can go pretty fast. Um, that's the Japanese combine. You can see it's pulling the grain up on its side. The threshing chamber is there. The beauty of this is that none of the chaff gets mixed in with the grain. It's just beating the grain off the head. And here, this is a field of red wheat. This was actually our best planting ever. Uh, 
we got about 4,200 pounds of hard weed off of this field. Um, I see it's there. All right, so you can see what that looks like. This is how we unload, how we move stuff around. Oh, that's our drying tables. So when you dry, you want to do about, I'm sorry, I'm running out of time, and I'll slow down. So if you put anything on a drying table like this in a greenhouse, you may want to make sure if you're doing it on a small scale, you only do it about an inch thick. You don't want to put it up above an inch. Because if you do, um, you want to make darn sure you got a really high fan on it and you can move air and you don't produce mold. You still have to turn it a couple times a day would be ideal. Um, but I would say the best thing to do is to, to not put it thick on those tables. What we built was a box. Uh, this has a floor that's a screen floor, and we just use a small heater to blow through there. So all the stuff that we do by hand, if it's only three or 400 pounds or something, we can throw it right in there. Um, we use tables. So this is what our cleaning, the Next Step Produce, the cleaning facility looks like. Um, air screen cleaner, that's probably the main tool that cleans your grain. So you got two screens um, that the top screen sorts off all the big stuff. The, 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 the bottom screen sorts out all the, the small stuff. And your clean grain comes to the other side. So this is hind sizing some seed. Um, so just quickly, this is us cleaning oats. So this is an indent cleaner. This is getting out all of the hulled oats in the hullless oats. So this is how we get it out. You can see that dust. That was the oat dust. It's everywhere. Look at all that dust. That's from oats. No, no other grain does that. Um, so then it's going through the seed cleaner. It's coming over a gravity table now. The gravity table, all the heavy stuff's on the left side. The lighter stuff's on the right side. The heavier stuff is the higher quality grain. So this stuff is going, uh, is a rejects. So that's going out. We recycle it back into the, the uh, gravity table again. And then it goes over to a color laser sorter. And so, and then we're bagging from there. And so what the color laser sorter can do, I don't know if it's showing, it'll show what the machine does, but I don't think I show the different qualities in the grain in this video. But you can see the grains dropping down this tube and it's using air to actually reject all the stuff that we program it to, to reject, to, to, to sort out. So while that grain is dropping, these streams of air are shooting out the stuff that we don't want. The indent cleaner, all right. So this is what we use. This will separate out like round stuff from elongated stuff. That's just a spiral separator. Uh, so we tried to use that for the, the, um, the lentils, but it didn't work. Uh, this is another drying box. This has a screen on the bottom. That over there is hot water that's being drawn in with a blower. And so I think Heinz can, we could do up to like 50 or 60 bushels in there. Uh, this is the larger dryer. This is a Japanese, this is our dryer, which is a Japanese recirculating dryer, which we can use for most grains. Uh, that's what it looks like. Uh, so most of the batches I can come out with, we can just stick them right in there and dry it down within four or five hours. We're bagging oats right there, transferring grains. And this is, we use, for storage, we use uh, refrigeration. Other people do other things, but we found that if you can get it around 50 degrees with low humidity, that is the best way to store your grain. Um, this is Heinz milling some corn. 
Oh, hold on one second. And that's rolling oats. All right, it doesn't. And you can see the oats on top. It's coming out of the roller. We use a vibrator to separate out the dust from the oats. And then we're bagging up the rolled oats there. It's a pretty simple process. Uh, that's a new game changer for us. That's an overhead sprinkler uh, traveler that we're going to use to get the beans up when it's dry out. And that's it. <laughs> Any questions? Go ahead. Don't ask questions unless you have the microphone, please. You was talking about your grains, and it appears that most of them be modern grains. Are you raising any ancient grains? Uh, we do einkorn, but einkorn does have a hull that you still have to, we have to run it through the, we only do einkorn because we can run it through the rice huller, but the emmer, uh, I don't think works, and then you got spelt. So we haven't figured out a good way to get the hull off of the spelt and the emmer, but we do do einkorn. Do you have many issues with the uh, bird predation on the rice? And if so, how do you handle that? Or do they just get their share and that's uh, all? Yes and no. So the worst year we had, one year we, so the Duborskian would come to harvest a lot faster than the, the Koshiakari, right? Uh, the first time I went to harvest with the Duborskian, I left the tube off of the combine. I spilled some grain on the ground. Um, this was, I think, our second year at it. I came back the next day. I was like, wow, look at all the hawks. And look at that owl. It's midday. And then I drove up closer to the farm, and I saw the swarm, like, Psh! <laughs> and, and once that happened, there was nothing. We covered a whole acre in Agrabon, and the birds lit on top of the Agrabon, poked holes in the Agrabon and got underneath. Once they know it's there, there's not much you can do to stop them. Now, that said, we've had years that were way worse than others. I think last year um, we had it in a backyard that seemed like it was the people had a nature preserve right behind it. That was a bad idea. Um, but in other situations like this year, bird predation was not a problem. You get a few birds, but you don't get, the longer you leave it in the field, the more you're likely to, to catch a starling flock. And those are the worst. So if it's just local birds, then they have their share. Starling flocks are a whole nother situation. Okay, one more question. Are, are you aware of any implements um, that might be usable in this process that could attach to a BCS type of, you know, walk behind tractor? Um, well, there's definitely, Joel sells a, a really nice grain drill. Um, I mean, it would be the same process where you figure out your tillage and then you come behind with the grain drill. And you could do really nice beds of different grain, like your wheats and all of those varieties with that, that machine. All right, I hope you all enjoyed this. Anybody else who has questions, you can come up later. I hope you found this useful. Thank you. All right.